Hey, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out on a Tuesday night. Uh, my name is Janelle Riley, and I'm so happy to welcome you to this conversation with writer, director, producer, groundbreaker, Noah Scovell. Um, odds are very strong that if you have a favorite TV show that was on in the last 20 years, she was somehow a part of it. Uh, we're talking everything from Murphy Brown to Sabrina the Teenage Witch to, well, good, I love that there are Sabrina fans, uh, to the recent reboot of The Muppets. Um, on the side, her side job, she's a best-selling author, having co-written Lean In with Sheryl Sandberg, and her new book, Just the Funny Parts, is, I think, required reading for every writer, every woman, every human being. <laughs> Please welcome Nell Scovell. I didn't know if you could hear me back there. I was like, I should have done the Oprah Nell Scovell. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. Um, well, can I just say, yes. I've, so I've been in the Writers Guild building and the Directors Guild building and Producers Guild. This, this is the one guild I do not have the talent to get into. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you all for coming. And, and if you're thinking, well, you haven't tried, I have. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> it's, I so admire actors, what they do, the control they have of their face and voice, one of the running themes throughout the book is that I have no poker face. <laughs> and um, there are times I really do wish I'd been a better actress. I'm curious because actually I assume a lot of, you all have to be SAG members to be here, but how many of you are writers as well? Yeah, I can yeah, figure, see, oh, you can great. do what I do, but I can't do what you do. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's true. I, you foolishly think that acting is easy or playing yourself is easy until you have to do it. And now I have so much mad respect for actors and anyone who goes through the audition process. Honestly. Yeah, there, there's a story early on where um, on one of my first jobs, I'm actually at a comedy club with uh, my friends Greg Daniels and Conan O'Brien. Never heard of them. And um, <laughs> I know I don't know what happened to them, but uh, I they were very funny. I hope they did well. And they were hanging out with Jay Leno, and it's the 80s, and I say something smart-ass, and he said, ah, oh, you should do stand-up. And I said, oh, no. And he, he pointed at the stage, and he said, um, don't you think you could do better than those guys? And I said, no, I think every one of them is brave. <laughs> and he goes, you shouldn't do stand-up. <laughs> You actually just topped, like, the only thing more terrifying I can think about and, uh, from acting is stand-up comedy. I would never even try. Wow. Yeah. It's horrifying. Although I did have a great experience on book tour. It was so nice. Stephen Colbert's show uh, had me on. And um, it was right around the time of the White House Correspondents' Dinner, which I had contributed jokes for President o Obama for about five years. And so everyone was asking me, like, would you write for Trump? And I said, no. Um, but then I thought of the question, could I write for Trump? Mm -hmm. So I wrote a bunch of jokes for him. And while I, it, it, please watch it, because Colbert, while I'm sitting there, read a few of the jokes out yeah. loud. So all day I'm getting ready for the show, and I'm thinking, you know, no wonder these late night hosts are so messed up. Like the, I, the pressure of being on TV, like going through that every day, millions are gonna see me, I have to perform. Um, and then when I sat there and I felt that wave of laughter, I went, oh, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> I got it. Because, you know, writers are always on the side, at the back of the theater. Mm -hmm. So it was the first time I felt that, you know, that wave of laughter from a joke I wrote. It was pretty amazing. I'm sure there's nothing more rewarding, but there's also nothing more terrifying yeah. to me. So yeah. it's probably not gonna happen in my lifetime. <laughs> um, but I am curious, it's kind of an odd question, but from what I recall, you grew up in Massachusetts? I did. Family wasn't, yeah. all right. And <laughs> in, in New Hampshire, no, like no connections to Hollywood. Right. Um, and uh, it, it really wasn't until my mid-20s when I was a magazine writer and I wrote for Spy Magazine. Um, do people remember Spy at all? Yes. Yeah. The, the first cover story was the 10 most embarrassing New Yorkers and you know who made the list? <laughs> no yeah. way! Yeah, so I have been making fun of this man for, since 1985. Have you ever met him? I haven't. Okay, yeah. I, was I was racking my brain. No, because the way you, I would cross paths with rich people would be, let's say, at a charity event, right. which he never went to. Weirdly enough. So, yes. um, 
<laughs> no, but that's where short fingered, fingered vulgarian came from Spy Magazine. <laughs> and it was, um, I was, and then Tina Brown hired me away for Vanity Fair. And it was in my, uh, I guess I was 26 or so when I bumped into an editor who said, Nell, I don't mean this as an insult, but I think you could write for television. <laughs> <laughs> and it was the first time I actually thought, oh, really? yes, true. I never really thought that people must write those shows. <laughs> <laughs> Some of them, yeah. Um, this may sound like a really weird question, and I don't even know if, it, if it's possible to answer, but was there a time when you knew that you were funny? Or if people started to tell you you were funny, or you realized you, you some people, yeah. I remember, I just thought everybody kind of was funny, and then you meet people who aren't. Right. And you go, oh. <laughs> yeah, now that was more my experience. I had, my siblings are all really funny. I'm, I'm the middle of five. I had, um, my dad's hilarious. Um, my mom was a great audience, which is almost as important as having someone funny. My aunts were hilarious. My dad's sister, um, I tell this story in the book about how my sister Alice was on a couch reading Little Women when my Aunt Pinky walked by, stopped, tapped her on the shoulder, and said, don't get too attached to Beth. <laughs> <laughs> sh Pinky was so great. And um, I do think, like, I, um, my, my mother went to my third grade parent-teacher conference, and the teacher said to her, um, Nell makes too many jokes in class. Could you please tell her to tone it down? And my mom delivered the message on my 40th birthday. No way. I swear to God. I had the best mom. You're kidding. Yeah. Actually, today is her yard site, so I'm a little late. For class, oh, I know. Mom was so great. She was my Harry Potter scar in this horrible business. Because, <laughs> you know, That's so many amazing. damaged people, and I'd be like, yeah, yeah my mom loved me. <laughs> and also sounds like your biggest fan if she was a good audience. Yeah, yeah. So that was, um, but I wasn't, you know, I didn't think you could be professionally funny. Mm -hmm. And in <laughs> fact, you know, I went to um, Harvard and I was on the Crimson, which is the paper. And I did go to a Lampoon comp meeting and, and just uh, went away without um, trying to, you know, get on. I was very intimidated. I'm curious, when you went to that Lampoon meeting, were there any other women there? Oh, that's a good question. I don't recall, although the president of the Lampoon my senior year was Lisa Henson. Oh, wow. Who um, was the daughter. Oh, yeah. right, right. So. so did you think um, journalism was sort of your career? Yeah. Or, and when this gentleman told you you should try TV it writing? It was a lady, but Oh, it yeah. was a lady. Oh, for some reason, in my mind, I thought it was Paul Ratner. No. Okay, I don't no, know no, where no. I got that. I'm sorry. No. Okay. Um, he's been on my mind a lot lately. It was Joanne Grebman. <laughs> oh, okay, that's so great. And was yeah. she? Did she? Was she a TV writer herself? No, she's just an editor. I think wow. I my my magazine work tended to have some sort of visual component to it, which is I think what made her mm -hmm. um, think. So that was. So I write a Gary Shandling show spec, right. and uh, I send it in, and they bought it which is like getting a home run uh, in yeah. your first at-bat as a rookie. Um, and then it turned into a long fly ball because then they didn't make it and they made me, they had me write another script and then they didn't make that, but they paid me. So it was just like the most perfect Hollywood experience <laughs> I could have going in. It's just very frustrating, but also kind of exciting um, and it's and how did you even know what to do? Did you just watch the show and teach yourself, or were there books, or...? Well, off my spy articles, I did get an agent. And um, Gavin Pallone, who was a oh, baby no agent, wow. yeah, who, I think he had just been, become an agent, so he was trying to sign people like crazy. And uh, he got me some examples. So I had samples mm -hmm. of, of the structure. Why did you pick, the, uh, it, it was It's Gary Shandling's show? Yeah. Um, the only reason I'm curious is because it's not a standard sitcom no. format, which is probably why you picked it. But also, did anyone advise you, like, no, you gotta do Cheers, you gotta do, you know, something? Uh, if I had known someone, they would have advised me that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was my favorite show. It's the one that made me laugh. Yeah. And I do, I guess people don't write spec scripts anymore. You're, people write pilots. But um, I always, my advice was always, don't choose the most popular show. Choose the show that's closest to your sensibility. Mm -hmm. 
I was told that too, weirdly. It didn't work out for me quite the same. But um, So your very first script gets to Gary Shandling. Yeah, yeah. And like, Ellen Zweibel at the time. Yeah, yeah. That's amazing. And I believe they, they flew you out. You met them. And they did. And I got to play ping pong with Gary. I tell, tell the whole story in the book. But it was... Um, it gave me that taste, and you know, I there's a ton of rejection at the back of the book. I have this long list of projects I've worked on, and most of them say, "On you know, not filmed <laughs> at the end." But I always got enough positive reinforcement to keep me going, and uh, I'm I'm fortunate that way. I was going to say, I mean, I'm I'm trying to imagine. Did you think when? I don't want to say luck, because it's not just luck. Obviously, yeah. there's a lot of talent and skill. But did you think, hey, this is going to be easy when um, your first script got picked up so quickly? No, but I, I, I liked writing it. Mm -hmm. And I, the focus always has to be on the creative side, because you don't c control the business side. So, um, But if you enjoy the process, uh, you know, I've always been in a volume business. And um, it's funny, because I watch my um, male friends. And as we've gotten older, you know, they've had to hustle more. And it's like, I've been hustling from yeah. day one. <laughs> um, and you know, I was just um, always writing spec scripts, always, uh, you know, whenever I went for a meeting for a show, I was the person who came in with four story ideas. Um, and that's, and in part I did that because I thought, well, if I can't think of any stories for the show, I don't want to be on it. <laughs> um, so right, yeah. Um, also, kind of a kind of a strange question, but because you weren't familiar with this business, did you think going in that um, being an, a woman you might be at a disadvantage, or did that not occur to you until you got into the business and kind of saw how people reacted? There, there was this beautiful bubble um, in the late 80s and early 90s. Um, I went to the Emmys for the first time in 1990 with, when I was on the staff at Letterman. And of the five best comedies nominated, three and a half were created by women. And it was Murphy Brown, Golden Girls, Designing Women, uh, Wonder Years was co-created by That's Carol right. Black, and Cheers, Murphy Brown won, and I'm sitting there thinking, well, you know, we did it. We <laughs> proved we could play with the big boys. They were, they, and they were not cult favorites. They were all top no, 10 shows. No. Um, so there was a, I think there was a backslide in mm -hmm. the 90s, and that's when it started getting harder. Really interesting. Yeah. So, because I thought maybe this was an illusion, and I was going to ask when the bubble burst. But yeah. <laughs> you really think that things got worse after that? I do. I yeah. think people relaxed because they thought, "Oh, it's been mm -hmm. solved." And then, uh, you know, it's it's there's a lot of money in this business, and I think whenever there's money, it, there's you want to keep the others out. You want to keep the money and the power to yourself. So I know one of your first jobs was the Wilton North Report. Yeah. which um, is so interesting to me because I've heard of this legendary show. I cannot find a photo from it. I cannot, <laughs> like, but Conan O'Brien and Greg Daniels were writers. Yeah. And there are many other people involved with it that went on to have great careers. Right. So this was um, the show that replaced Arsenio Hall and Fox. It was Fox's first big foray into late night. And um, they were trying to find a host. And uh, we all remember vividly Ellen DeGeneres coming in, <laughs> nailing her audition, and the executive producer saying, nah. <laughs> um, and instead, they hired these two really bland DJs from Sacramento. Uh, and it was, I mean, this show just ate material. It was an hour every single night. Um, so it. It did not go well. It was canceled after a month. When I called, I have some of my own personal photos from that time, um, and I called Fox to get permission to use some screenshots uh, from the videos I had. They wiped the show from their corporate memory. <laughs> they, they literally, legal said that show did not air on this network. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Did you have to try and convince them, or did you just No, I just said, point? great, then I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> <laughs> but was that sort of your first experience, like being on a staff of a writing show? 
Yes, that okay. was. Yeah. And I mean, despite the fact that you only lasted a month, I'm, I'm assuming it taught you a lot. It did, and it, it um, you know, I've had lifelong friendships with Conan and Greg, and, and so, you know, you start, it was part of starting to build connections uh, in the business. Mm -hmm. And then from there, did you go to the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour? Was that the next step? Oh, I didn't know there'd be a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Were you the only female writer on that staff? I'm I was, to okay, I was. Yeah. And then um, Newhart was my first sitcom, oh, which wow, was, I worked great. on the, the last season of Newhart, the one set in Vermont. So I was there for the big finale with oh, Suzanne so Plachet, great. which was great. So that was your first sitcom writing staff yeah. job? That's yeah. amazing. I mean, that's you know pretty much starting at the top. How did, how did it lead to that? Or did, did you stop at Letterman first? No, Letterman came after, came after Newhart. Newhart. Oh, okay. Yeah, no, it was Newhart, then I wrote a Simpsons, and then I get this dream job, which involves going back to New York. Because most people go from um, you know late night variety, they want to get into prime time. And I had done prime time, and then finally get this call. I kept sending material to Letterman, because it was such a, um, you know, he was, he was the funniest guy on TV at the time, and it was very snarky. Um, and it, it took a while, but they finally called and said, Dave would like to meet you. Wow. Yeah. And you were, as I recall, the second female writer ever on that show, yeah. after Meryl Marco. Was there ever a third? <laughs> there, there was. I there think was. all okay. told, in 33 years, they had nine women. Um, if you add up the time the nine women spent on the show, there are individual men who were there for longer. Really? Um, but the, the really astonishing um, fact is that in 33, 34 years, not one writer of color. Oh my God. That is astonishing. Not Hispanic, not Asian, not African American, not a single writer of color. And especially for a show that shoots in New York. I'm trying to like fathom it's, that. Yeah. Yeah. I remember when I was writing the book, I, I wrote that down and thought, well, I should add some commentary and, you know, like, you literally can't do worse. Or, and then in the end, it's just, there's nothing you can say about mm -hmm. it. It just speaks for itself. Yeah. Uh, right. I mean, were they aware at the time that there was a problem or did they not want <laughs> to acknowledge it? Were they aware that they were yeah. <laughs> discriminatory? <laughs> uh, yes, I believe yeah. they were. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I remember when, uh, long after you had left the show, was it 19, it was 2009, actually. It was yeah. after it was revealed Letterman had had these affairs with staff members. You wrote an article about, uh, for Vanity Fair? Yeah. Just about the very masculine work environment. And so that was about 10 years ago. Um, you were pretty established at that point. But at the same time, did anyone advise you not to write this article? Oh, I, um, myself. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I <laughs> Uh, and, you know, it is the only time I, I made this decision to, you know, it's like Fight Club. You don't talk about Fight Club. And it felt like I was somehow betraying this whole system, which had been very good to me. And um, I wasn't going to say anything. Well, and I should say, so Letterman comes out and says to his audience, I've had sex with women I work with. What does the audience do? Have you seen the they clip? They applaud him, right? They, they laugh and applaud. It was a different time, and I do wonder if it happened today, would the reaction be different? Can I see a show of hands? Who thinks the reaction would be different? I actually do, yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. All right. <laughs> um, and, yeah, and, um, but at the same time, Nancy Franklin, who's a great TV critic for The New Yorker, had pointed out that at the time there were zero women writing for Leno, Letterman, and Conan. And, so something clicked in my head that there was this moment in time where people were paying attention to late night because of Dave's personal story. And could I shift the discussion from you know, interns in the bedroom to writers, <laughs> to women in the writer's room? And you know, I went to sleep saying, I'm not going to do it. And I woke up in the middle of the night and started writing. Um, <laughs> and I, it was a moment of like who, of, it was an ex existential moment. Mm -hmm. So the, the book is arranged 
by this old Hollywood joke, which I think it's true for actors as well as, yeah. I heard it for writers, and I, I'll use myself, I, most of you have probably heard it, but the four stages of the career are, who is Nell Scovell, get me Nell Scovell, get me a younger, cheaper Nell Scovell, and who is Nell Scovell? <laughs> <laughs> and to me, the fourth one, instead of becoming about me returning to obscurity was, who am I? What do I stand for? Am I going to speak out? Because um, I had standing, you know. Mm -hmm. I, I had been in that room, and I knew the excuses for why they don't hire women, and I knew they were bullshit. Because so often it was, women don't want these jobs. Well, you don't tell women when the jobs are available. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so they can apply for them. Um, Didn't he try, because he fairly recently interviewed Tina Fey and tried that as an excuse too. Yeah. He said, um, I just can't imagine a woman would want to be here. And she was like, well, we do. Yeah. You know, and you wrote about that too, yeah, I, did. I believe. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, he must really hate me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, he said, who, what woman would want to work for our dumb little dog and pony show? Oh, you, that pays writers minimum and wins Emmys? Who would want that? Right. Well, and the other crazy, creepy thing was uh, he forgot that his head writer for five years <laughs> was a woman, That's right. Meryl yeah. Marco, who, and by the way, when she stepped down from being head writer, um, the show never won another writing Emmy. Wow. Really? Yeah, they I won other show that. Emmys, but they never won the Emmy specifically for that. writing. I remember being a kid and, and not knowing how things behind the scenes worked, but, but feeling a shift in the show. And yeah. I was sort of f familiar with who Meryl was just because um, she's, she does dog rescue, and or not, uh, not rescue, but it's yeah, a big no, dog she's amazing. Yeah, yeah, and, and like, only years later did I put together that it, the show really lost something when it lost her voice. Oh, she is hilarious. Yeah. And, and so often writers, you know, they're, they're shooting at the same target. Yep. She's, she's over in the weeds, yeah. <laughs> you know, doing her own thing. And uh, she's amazing. So when you were on that show, I imagine you're just so happy to be there and you probably don't want to rock the boat too much. Yeah. But would you bring up trying to get other women or people of color there? Or were you not even aware of it? Because sometimes it's only in retrospect that we go, <laughs> something was wrong. Well, I wasn't there that long, <laughs> for one thing. <laughs> so um, I end up quitting. You know, it's my dream job. And I still remember the day I walked to the 30 Rock, you know, um, for the first time. and. It, there wasn't that much writing on the show. So it wasn't all just, it, it was a pretty hostile place, but it also creatively wasn't that fulfilling. Because I'd already been writing entire episodes for sitcoms. So now you're one of 14 people trying to get your one line in the top 10 list, right? I'm not very good at math, but it, 14 <laughs> writers, top 10. Um, so, you know, I, I walked away and then got hired on Coach which, with Barry Kemp, who, yeah. fr and I spent a few seasons there, and he really taught me how to write a sitcom. And um, I didn't really look back until 2009 when I, I spoke out. What are the excuses they use? I'm just curious. I know there's this women don't want the job. Yes. Yeah. Or it, like they don't want the job. They don't apply for the job. They, it's Dave's voice. So here's what I always say, you know, well, you know, it's all, there. it's Dave's voice, it's Colbert's voice, it's Seth Meyers' voice, and so they need white men to write for them. And I said, no, you're not writing for the host. Right. Mm -hmm. And they go, what? They go, you're writing for the audience. And unless the audience is all white men, which I don't think anyone wants their audience to be, then you should have a lot of diversity in the writer's room. Mm -hmm. And I think more women do watch TV. I think yeah. that's true. <laughs> Uh, I want to backtrack to pre-Letterman, your Simpson spec script. I know I'm going to butcher it because it's it's one fish, two fish, red fish, blow fish. One fish, two fish, blow fish, blue fish. So close. So it's Homer eats uh, fugu and thinks he's going to die. Yeah, it's a great episode. Yeah. And you should, if for no other reason, read the book because it is like a case study in how to pitch and write. Because you went in with a very different idea, or you went in with several ideas. No, but I went in. That was my yeah. idea. And um, so, as a journalist, because I was a journalist before I became um, a TV writer, I, I had this sense of like you hold on to primary sources. So um, I was hired to do a. Um, 
freelance, not a spec, a freelance Simpsons script. Well, they actually hired people to write. Well, back then it was just a weird ass cartoon and nobody was like <laughs> calling them up saying, I love yeah. this show other than me. <laughs> they didn't even have many writers on staff. If I recall the time. Uh, no, well, it was pretty small. We yeah. could all sit in Sam Simon's little office, and now I think they have like three different rooms going. Wow. And uh, but that was uh, so I saved. Like I have when I went in and pitched. And one of the fun things in the book is um, if you've seen that episode, there's a lot of loose ends. There weren't supposed to be. There was a tag that was actually. Um, voiced, although they never made it because the, the episode ran long. And so the Simpsons, they were really nice and they let me reprint the original tag for that show. That's right. Yeah. And you have to buy the book to find out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, was that again a show that you just really liked and I wanted to it. write for? Yeah. yeah. How come you only wrote for it once? <laughs> Should I not ask? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, it was sadly, I think, another five seasons and over a hundred episodes before another woman wrote a Simpsons episode. You're kidding. No. Was it by any chance Jennifer Crittenden? It was. Okay, because I started, I, again, yeah. I started seeing this name yeah. come up and I think I recognized, oh, it's a woman writer and she wrote some of the best episodes She's ever. She's terrific, yeah. Oh, that's a bummer. Um, so who's it harder to write for, Homer Simpson or Barack Obama? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think Barack Obama is a, is a sin, sitcom character. He was the leader of the free world who lived with his two daughters, his wife, and his mother-in-law. <laughs> and so in my mind, like, he never got his way at yeah. home. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, so, uh, no, he was great. I mean, it is a character, president of the United kind of States. Is, yeah. and, and that whole... You know, when you write character comedy, it's all about getting into the head of that person. Um, so how does one get a gig like that, writing for, you know, the most powerful man in the world? Oh, well, it was a series of, uh, the president was visiting Facebook, and um, at that point I, I had done some writing for both Mark Zuckerberg and Sheryl Sandberg, and they asked me to, um, if I could come up with some funny opening remarks. And so I wrote some joke, I don't remember the exact wording, but it was basically um, saying, you know, welcome President Obama. Um, if you had uh, 500,000 more followers, you'd be as popular as SpongeBob SquarePants. <laughs> <laughs> and I got a note back saying we're trying to honor the president, not roast him. Uh, but. Cheryl thought they were funny enough and John Favreau was there and she showed him that joke and he said, oh, the president could do that joke. So that he wrote to me and said, could we use it? And I said, well, I'm happy to serve my country. <laughs> and, uh, and he did it and it was very funny and self-deprecating. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, they just put me on that list. So after that, do you have to talk with him and go over jokes? And no, are you pitching not, to the president? No. Okay. No. But you've obviously met him. I haven't. He sent me a lovely photograph that said, um, you know, Dear Nell, thanks for all the jokes. I'm glad I was able to provide the material. <laughs> <laughs> he's so funny. He's so him. funny and he's a great performer. He really is. Yeah, yeah that's amazing. Yeah. Do you have someone to bounce those ideas off to tell you if you're going too far, like Secret Service? or? <laughs> <laughs> they... I, um, I did write one joke, which they... Um, did not do, which I'll read here, uh, which was, um, so just to warm up, I, I have a list of jokes that they, I submitted they didn't use, and one was, welcome, I know many of you came tonight to see the charismatic leader of North America, but Justin Trudeau couldn't make it. <laughs> that might have hit a little too close to him. Um, and then this one they didn't do either. I turned 50 while in office, which meant I had to have my first colonoscopy. And guess what they found? Mitch McConnell. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. That guy can obstruct anything. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, you, going back, you had mentioned you went to work on Coach. Yeah. You mentioned Newhart. You also got to write for Murphy Brown. I did. Yeah, which, which has to be a, I don't, maybe it wasn't a dream come no, true. No, it was. <laughs> you know, I talk about in the book that the, when people um, 
ask about shows and whether it was a good experience, I always break it down into the three P's, and I'm sure it's the same for actors, um, the people, the process, and the product. And it's so rare that all three are really satisfying. So often, you know, you'll be on a, on a show and you'll love the people and it's a good show, but the hours are long and you never see your family. And so the process just, you know, isn't something you look forward to or, you know, often um, you can be with people you like working really hard and nobody's watching the show or the, the, it doesn't come out the way you hoped it would. Um, one of the few times all three were satisfying was Murphy Brown. The actors were so professional. Just they always, they were great, they knew their lines. And it was, um, it really was the way I would love for all TV to be, which is a partnership between the writers and the actors. And uh, too often I feel like the process is, uh, ego-based and it should be mission-based like we all have the same mission to make the best show we can and the idea that it becomes like the stage fighting with the writers is, is ridiculous I don't know if it was shortly thereafter but you finally got the opportunity to create and run your own show with Sabrina the Teenage Witch I switched to I was a half-hour writer and then you know I had my two kids and I had this opportunity to work on drama and um, I decided to take it because the hours are better. And uh, it's weird because I've been in drama actually hour long, longer than I was in half hour. But I like funny hours, so it was always like Monk, which was a great show, mm. and NCIS, which was is funnier than I actually haven't watched it recently. But in the early days, it was very character based, um, and Charm was fun too. So did you leave Sabrina to go work on Charmed? Uh, not, they no, they, they, there was, uh, I left uh, Sabrina and then I directed my first movie. Right. Was how that, that timeline. Um, I was just thinking of like classic By the things. way, I can make it up, right? Because yeah. nobody knows. So <laughs> I'm not like, why? Well, hmm, yeah. <laughs> I re hearing that story, um, about Charmed is like, it's, it, for me, it's like such a shining example of the, what you just don't do in a writer's room, what you don't do to your coworker, yeah. to, to a person, yeah. you know? And so I was curious if experiences like that, when you finally got the opportunity to create and run your own room, yeah. you learn from the good and you learn from the bad. Right, and there, there are too many bullies in positions of power and who are unchecked. And I'll never understand, so, you know, since I've done some work for Facebook and some other speeches, I gotten this glimpse into corporate America, mm -hmm. the way like most corporations work. And everybody does these 360 reviews, right? Which is twice a year. You ask everyone who works with someone. You don't just get a review from your boss from upper level to lower level. They ask assistants, how are you treated? And it's all done anonymously with, you know, a third or HR or a third person. And you know, then you, that you're brought into a room and they say, here's what people praised and here's what you need to work on. Hollywood, I've never once been asked what was someone like to work with, by, by a network or studio. Right. I've been asked by fellow writers. Right. Um, I've never been asked if an actor, you know, same thing. And so it's all this unchecked, you know, behavior. Mm -hmm. And there are no exit interviews. Someone gets fired. Why aren't they brought in and asked you know, what happened, what, or in your opinion. Same with actors, right? I mean, has anyone ever had a review or exit interview? No. And it's just, it's... It I, is really strange, actually. It is really yeah. strange. Yeah. Uh, because maybe if you knew someone was going to get an exit interview, you wouldn't fire someone just because, you know, they chewed gum in a way you didn't like. <laughs> Have you, if, if it's not a sore subject, although you're pretty frank in your book, have you ever been fired? And I, I know you're, was it Smothers Brothers? Once, no, 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 no. I was, wasn't picked up. It was a, a short-lived show, and it was, um, it was a show that was on the bubble. It was a new show, and as they often do, you know, you go, well, we don't have the right uh, creative team. 
And so I was let go, along with another writer who's gone on to great fame and fortune, um, but I won't name him. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was upsetting, but then at least I thought, all right, well, you know, they'll do nine more episodes, and I had a contract yeah. where I get paid. They did one more, and then they got canceled. <laughs> <laughs> I can't win. <laughs> Even when they fire me, I can't win. <laughs> so you would have actually liked it to have continued. Oh, yeah. The, okay. <laughs> I was like, there was a little bit of schadenfreude there. Like, you were like, no, yeah. but it is this funny story because I'd, I've never been fired before. It's, I'm in my 40s, so it happens to me for the first time. And she was the showrunner, was very professional about the whole thing. Um, and I just start, I go, well, thank you um, very much. And uh, I, then I just start crying. Like, but ridiculous amounts of tears. Like, I'm. <laughs> Like I'm 12 years old, and and I just and uh, the only question I thought of like, what will you tell people if they ask happened? Yes. And she said, no, I'll just say, you know, you're you're a good writer. You just weren't writing right for the show. And I'm like, okay. So um, I leave, and then I call my husband, and he's like, you didn't like this show anyway. <laughs> this is great, you know. And I was having to work really long hours. Um, and uh, so I pack up my stuff, and I, I didn't have much because I didn't like the show. I put it in my, the trunk of my car, and then I go, you know, before I leave, I really should do the professional thing and go back and just end things, you know, with the showrunner in, the, in a really gracious way. So I go back, and I said, can I talk to you for a sec? And she says, yes. And I said, I just want to thank you. And then I just start crying. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> but then we were laughing about yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I'm sure she remembers you at least now. <laughs> um, uh, we actually have quite a few questions about okay. Sabrina. Um, Sabrina? Uh, yes, there's a lot of Sabrina fans right. here. I love oh, it. Oh, hi. Um, was it Lena Dunham that was like talking about how oh, yeah, seminal Lena that Dunham. show was for her? Yeah. yeah. Well, if you're, so it was 1996. So if you're like in your early 30s and you were in that sweet spot mm -hmm. for watching Sabrina, um, and yeah, I love when you know these young women in their thirties were like um, touched by it. And I rewatched um, an episode recently, and it was one I rewatched it because Chris Elliott was the guest star. One of the most fun parts of running your own show is you get to bring in all your the weird people that you yeah. love, right? <laughs> um, and we had great guest stars from like, Dana Gould to. Uh, um, oh, you know, Brian Cranston was on Sabrina. Because really? I'd worked, he played on Coach, he played Hayden's ex wife's new husband. That's right. And he came in and killed. Um, so nobody knew who he was. And we, I remember he was so grateful because we offered him this role and didn't make him come in a, an audition. <laughs> and he played a witch lawyer wearing a four piece suit. So it's a four-piece suit, is um, jacket, vest, pants, and then he drops his pants and shows he's got boxer shorts <laughs> in, in the tweed material. That's on the internet. Um, <laughs> That's so awesome. Uh, so um, what were we talking about? Uh, well, we have a question from Sean. Oh, Chris Connor. Elliott. So, oh, yes. so I watched this because I, I, I was doing a thing in Chicago, and they wanted to air an episode, and it's one where the family goes skiing in Mar on Mars. And um, <laughs> Sabrina, because that's where they have the highest mountains in the, in the uh, galaxy. And Sabrina goes off with this cute ski instructor. And they're having a picnic in a volcano. And um, there's a moment where the Mars probe flies over and they wave. <laughs> and at one point, he moves to kiss her. And she pulls back. And he says, I sense you're uncomfortable. Do you want to go back to the lodge? And I was like, oh, I was modeling consent wow. <laughs> for all these kids. That's amazing. Like, how great was that? Wow. Uh, <laughs> without even knowing it. No, but it was. I mean, it. And it, yeah. it does point to the importance, though, of having women create these shows, because mm -hmm. I don't think a man would have done that. No, no. Uh, we have a question from Sean. Is it Rohani? Sorry if I butcher anyone's name. Could you explain your experience as a show creator from concept to green light? What materials did you use to pitch? 
who'd you pitch to, and what were the keys from a business standpoint to getting it greenlit? Oh my God. Well, I, really yeah, I was going to say. Um, no, it's hard, and by the way, it's changed a lot, too, in the 30 years. Someone um, recently said, how do I break in? And I said, I have no idea. <laughs> like, all my information is going to be super old. Um, I do know that the move has been, um, you know, people want less information than they used to be. Like, you, one of the things, like in the early days when I was pitching, they would always say, and what's the third episode of the fifth season? Oh, like, I, I don't ever hear that question anymore. Um, it, it's, uh, so I'm not sure I'm the best person <laughs> to answer. This was an existing property, though, because Sabrina is based on yeah, the Archie was, comics. Yeah. yeah. Did someone bring it to you, or did you have the idea? I did. It was Viacom. And uh, I had just shot my first pilot for the WB called Prudy and Judy. And it was starred Laura Bell Bundy, who went on to be Elle Woods oh, on yes. Broadway, and Jackie Tone, who's crushing it on Glow. And they were 15. Um, Laura's father was played by Alan Thick, who really wow. enjoyed hugging his daughter. And uh, <laughs> may he rest in peace. Uh, and I was super sad when it, uh, we shot the pilot, Barry Kemp directed it, and it didn't go forward. And I was kind of heartbroken. And then Sabrina came up, so um, I jumped on board. You mentioned earlier about um, going off to direct, you, you did at least two movies. You did yeah. uh, Haley Wagner's Star for yeah. Showtime. And it was one of us. For a lifetime. Um, Can I just say something since we're at SAG? Yeah. So It Was One of Us was about five college roommates who go back to their 10th reunion. They're women. And um, I remember before I headed up, we uh, shot it in Vancouver, and it was a non-union film. So it was mm. one of those low, low budget lifetime movies. Um, and I thought, well, this is going to be a nightmare with five women, and they're all going to be, you know, fighting for screen time. These five women made it work because yeah. the crew, I, I mean, the, the example I give, like we had a scene that shot in a sauna and they were supposed to cut the breakers to the sauna so we could shoot first thing in the morning. We get in there and it's, you know, 100 degrees. And someone joked, it's like a sauna in here. <laughs> um, and so it fogged up the camera. And so it was, it was really like a the crew that couldn't shoot straight kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And these five actresses, um, Sarah Joy Brown, Elisa Donovan, uh, Jordan um, uh, Ladd, uh, I'm horrible, uh, Kira um, Clavel, and Marissa Jared Winoker, uh, you know, Tony Award winner. They we had no rehearsal time. They would get together mm -hmm. on their own time and rehearse. They uh, they busted their butts for you know for me for the production, and uh, it w it was really a beautiful thing. I actually really want to see this movie because you talk about it a lot in the book, and you know sort of the things that went wrong that were out of your control. <laughs> um, you have to read it to believe it. It is it is just amazing, but. Uh, you mentioned, you know, if you get the chance to direct again, what you'd like to do. I mean, do you want to direct oh, again? Oh, yeah. Okay. So it didn't sour yeah. you completely. Oh, no. Directing, it's writing in, in 3D. It's so much fun. It's uh, the ultimate collaboration. You know, I quote Stephen um, Gagan, who said to me once, you know, you think you're going to be the dictator when actually you're, you're the center that has to find the harmony and everyone's coming to you with problems, and you need to solve them. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, um, I, they were both really, hard, you know, it's a challenge. Mm -hmm. So uh, I like a challenge. <laughs> we have a question from Laura. Uh, wants to know, when you're writing alone, even when you're writing alone, the creative process is never, um, or at best, rarely done in a vault. How do you find the balance between taking and implementing other people's notes and sticking to what you originally set out to write? Well, um, that's the whole game, isn't it? You know, and if, if, if you just, if you don't want anyone else's input, write novels, right? And if, if you want a collaboration, TV's great. And in the book, I quote um, my actress friend, Amy Hone, who, oh, by the way, who did the audio version. So, so good. 
yeah. she's amazing and so much better than I would have been. Um, so she once said to me, the only, she said, the only way to move forward creatively is to allow yourself to be judged. And it's just that that's everything, right? And it's hard and like ugh, nobody wants it. Although, have you noticed that they've rebranded um, criticism as feedback? Oh my god, <laughs> right? that's hilarious. <laughs> which is good. And the, the lesson you need to learn, which is hard, is you don't have to take all the criticism. You take what you believe, you take what makes your thing better, and then you just disregard the rest. Are they going to start calling reviewers like feedbackers? Feedbackers. Yes. <laughs> uh, actually, because you, you mentioned, did you ever uh, think that you would be writing books? Did that come about sort of through knowing Cheryl? She yeah. kind of talked to you So I have a into. sister yeah. who writes books. And so you know how in families it's like, Claire's the book writer, and I'm the TV writer. And uh, so you know, when Cheryl calls me, called me um, one day and said I had been helping her with speeches, like she gave a speech at Barnard, which, where she talked about leaning in and you know, the question of what would you do if you weren't afraid. Um, she called me and she said, I, I just got an offer for a book and I think I want to do it, but I told them I wouldn't do it without you. And I said, Cheryl, I've never written a book before. And she said, neither have I. <laughs> <laughs> and she was just so cute and enthusiastic, so we, we leaned in. <laughs> Do you think that um, just the funny parts would would that have come about if you hadn't done Lean In? No. Yeah. No. And what was um, so fascinating about the process, and I don't know, is, has anyone here tried to write a memoir or, yeah, is you can't relive your life, but you can reframe it. <laughs> um, and I found it. I I went into this thinking like you know I'm gonna tell some yeah. stories and get some revenge, and then. You start writing, um, and all you want to do is thank the people who were nice to you. Yeah. And you kind of want to forget about the rest. <laughs> and in fact, I made a T-shirt that I haven't had the guts to wear, but it says, "I'm writing a memoir, and you're not in it." <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Oh, I'm so sorry. We are almost out of time. I want to get through as many of these as possible. Uh, Amy Walker, hey, uh, wants to know what are you most proud of, regardless of how many people have seen it. And oh. why? Most proud. Well, it would have to be Sabrina because that was um, there's an episode with uh, with Raquel Welch, which is really weird and fun, and she plays the third aunt from The Sun, and there's. Um, it's, the, it, it's a metaphor for Sabrina doesn't want to do her homework and her sort of Auntie Mame comes and whisks her away to her palace where she's got like the room of gratuitous praise and you open up the door and you just hear like, you're wonderful! <laughs> and, and you know, there's, she gets, Sabrina gets to make her own music video because that's yeah. cool and, and at the end she realizes that that life is empty and she should go back and do her homework. Um, <laughs> So, but, and Ra Raquel was amazing. Yeah. yeah. She looks amazing. I saw her like five years ago. Yeah. She looks like 30. She's so talented. Yes. She sings, she's funny. Mm -hmm. she's back, I mean, in the old days, they all, they, they did, did it all. Yeah. 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 Uh, this is a question from, is it Misha? Yeah. Serville? Circle. Circle. Oh, sorry, I'm, like, I'm going blind. Um, in your book, Only the Funny Parts, super book. Just the funny parts. So, I was going to take the blame for that one, but I can't. <laughs> <laughs> she says, the percentage of women writers in TV based on age and the small amount, do you think that changes or will change? And will we see more women writers in an age because of the need for content and diversity in stories? Uh, I, um, I want to be optimistic. <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm really waiting for this st sustained statistical data that tells me it's getting better because I've been hearing it's getting better for my entire career <laughs> and the numbers just don't bear it out. Um, but there is a lot more content and the, the way we create shows has changed and those barriers are changing and, you know, will there be networks 10 years from now? I mean, I think there, there are huge changes. Um, 
And uh, so, I don't know. I love Broad City and Another Period. Like, there, there are yeah. some amazing shows which I know wouldn't have been on 10 years ago. Right, and probably we won't see on network TV ever. But Well, I shouldn't say that, actually. There's some good network shows right now. I'm, I'm struggling yeah. to think of them, but I know there are some of them. <laughs> um, kind of a strange question, but I imagine you've been working on this book for a while. And it happened to come out in a year where we're dealing with, you know, people are taking notice of the Me Too movement and Time's yeah. Up. And I mean, that's it's actually wonderful timing for you, although it's, you know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's like, no, you it's, it is. You, you yeah. don't want to like be like, yes, you know. Yeah. Um, but you, you couldn't have predicted that things would work out this way, that we'd be in this moment. Um, it's it's inter interesting. So I um, have a Me Too story where, uh, you know, with a head writer very early in my career. And when I, it was one of the chapters I wrote to help sell the book, so that was like three years ago. And I was really nervous about coming out with the story and, you know, what would people think of it and would they believe me? And um, then, you know, October rolls around with Weinstein and then I couldn't wait for the book to come out yes. and to lend my voice. And, uh, you know, the reason I told it was, I think we have a tendency to look at people who have been successful and think, well, nothing bad ever happened to her, right? Because, you know, she, that would have stopped her. And um, bad things happen and you keep going if, if you know, you um, have friends and supportive family. And um, I just, ref you know, the, I start the book with a quote um, that that which doesn't kill us allows us to regroup and retaliate. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you've been so busy, you know, writing this book and you've been on this crazy tour and the response has been so overwhelming. Um, did you worry about the response? Because it is very personal. Uh, Yes, and it, it doesn't come naturally mm -hmm. to me, but, you know, if I didn't write my memoir, who would? <laughs> no, it, it is a little like, remember Kilroy was here? Like, there, there is that, I, I did feel somewhat compelled yeah. to, um, you know, we have so many stories from actresses that are amazing, like the Tina Fey's book and Mindy's book and um, Amy's book and Amy's book, and, and they're great, but there is something about, like, what if you're not out front? Mm -hmm. That's not who you are, but you still want to have a voice um, and be in, in the entertainment world. So I do hope it's uh, inspiring. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I always feel guilty asking someone this who's just completed such a massive project, because it's like asking someone when they're going to have their next kid. But what are you working on now, or what are you looking forward to working on? Well, I would, d directing again would be yeah. uh, my first choice, and I have a bunch of scripts. I love when they, they um, you know, actually, this is, I'll, I'll say it in fact, like every now and then actresses will complain, like, you know, I never see scripts about strong women. We are writing them. Yeah. <laughs> they, they're just not getting made. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, that would be be my hope is to direct again, and if not, you know, I'm I got an idea yesterday for like a fun Christmas movie. So no way, that's you need the actors? best when you get the idea <laughs> like that. I, it made me happy because it had been a while since I had had that yeah. sudden like, oh, that's a good concept, and and it just kind of flowed out. Well, again, I want to recommend everyone read the book and listen to it. I did both, actually. I, I highly recommend that. Um, I, want, I can't thank you enough for oh, well, your thank time. Thank you all for thank coming. Thank you guys for a great audience. Thank you. <laughs>